Greetings, everyone, and welcome to our event, Malcolm X at 98, honoring his life and the impact of his life on others. Please join me in welcoming our host, Kafense Chike. Dr. Chike was born and raised in Detroit, Michigan, and has over 30 years combined experience as teacher of social studies and professor of African-American studies. Dr. Chike has taught in two of Detroit's premier African-centered schools, the Aisha Shule W.E.B. Du Bois Prep and Insroma Institute, and various colleges and universities throughout metropolitan Detroit. He currently serves as an assistant professor of teaching and learning, community coordinator in African-American studies at Wayne State University. His research includes African and African-American education, African spirituality systems and spirituality, and African and African-American cultural identity formation. Dr. Chike is a proud father of one son. Dr. Chike. Greetings and welcome, everyone. Thank you for the kind introduction, uh, my dear sister and colleague, Demisha. We'd like to welcome you again to our the last in our series of looking ahead to Juneteenth pre-Juneteenth uh, programs and uh, as part of the Juneteenth committee here at Wayne State. And this is our third year of doing an annual celebration of Juneteenth, but we always have a series of events leading up to Juneteenth. And our program, our looking ahead program will culminate in a week long series of events, which will include an opening ceremony. This, is, this begins June the 12th at 2 p.m and goes through June the 20th. And I will announce those that series of events later in the program. Our program today, looking ahead at Juneteenth, Malcolm X in 98, honoring his life and the impact of his life on others is a panel discussion. And we are elated, excited to have three seasoned community activists with us as we honor, commemorate, venerate, and memorialize the life of Malcolm X Today, his birthday is actually tomorrow, but we have with us today uh, three local activists, as I said earlier, and I'd like to just give a brief introduction of each. We have, uh, we call Mama and Baba in our community affectionately. Mama Shoshana Shakur is a revolutionary who has engaged in community activism for most of her life. Shoshana was born into an activist family in Detroit, Michigan. Her parents, Lou and Fran Talia Ferro, participated in the civil rights movement locally while her older brother, former attorney and Wayne State a law school alumni, is that correct? Mm -hmm, that's right. Okay. Uh, excuse me, her older brother, former attorney, Jackson, Mississippi Mayor Chokwe Lumumba was fighting for the freedom of his people throughout this country. However, Ms. Shakur is an activist in her own right as a former AFSC, AFSCME, AFSCME member, Detroit Federation of Teachers and Concerned Teachers United member. She organized rallies and protests while fighting to improve the education system and juvenile justice system. Ms. Shakur has also provided extracurricular, extracurricular and after-school services for over 4,000 young people through her work as a teacher and youth program director. She has also organized and coordinated political, cultural, and educational forums as a member and or co-founder of several activist organizations. These include the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, Detroit Chapter, the founder and director of the Heritage Youth Program, the Coalition for Property Tax Justice, the Black Legacy Coalition, the Coalition for Police Transparency and Accountability, the Sacred Heart Church Education Commission. Shoshana is also, along with being a loving mother, dear friend and comrade, she is also a poet and has directed several plays as well. Welcome. welcome to our program this evening and thank you for being here, Mama Sh Shoshana, excuse me. Sorry. Also we have Dr. Errol Henderson who earned his PhD in political science at the University of Michigan after graduating magna cum laude. Phi Beta Kappa from Wayne State University. He has authored nearly 50 scholarly publications 
including five books. For the last 20 years, he was an associate professor of political science at Pennsylvania State University. Henderson was born and raised in the Booster Project on the near east side of Detroit. His 2019 book, The Revolution Will Not Be Theorized, examines the relationship between Black culture and political revolution in the United States and is available for free at uh, forward slash twice news.jhu.edu forward slash book forward slash six seven zero nine eight. Welcome to the panel, and I'd like to thank you also, Dr. Henderson, and also thank you for being a mentor of sorts and, and an inspiration as well. We appreciate you. And our, our last but not least panelist today, a very good friend and comrade as well, Baba Malik Yakini, who is a co-founder and executive director of the Detroit Black, Black Community Food Security Network also known as DBCFSN, which operates the seven acre D-Town farm and is spearheading the opening of the Detroit Food Commons in Detroit's North End that will house the Detroit People's Food Corps. He serves as a board member of the co-op. Yakini used the work of DBCFSN as a part of the larger movement for building power, self-determination and justice. He is adamantly opposed to the systems of white supremacy, capitalism, and patriarchy. He has an intense interest in contributing to the development of an, internet, of in, an international food sovereignty movement that embraces black communities in the Americas, the Caribbean, and Africa. He is a co-founder of the National Black Food Justice and Alliance program as well. I'd like to welcome you all you also, Baba Malik. And I just have to say, I'd like to commend you all on what I would say is your humility because I know there is so much more, but of course, if we focused on the bios, we that would take up the whole program. So I'm honored and pleased and especially honored that you responded to the call when I reached out to you all to become a part of this program. So I would like the discussion by first asking each of you, if you don't mind, maybe sharing with us your, your earliest introduction to the life of Malcolm X and his work in, in, from a personal context. And we'd like to start with you, if you don't mind, uh, Mama Sh Shoshana. Okay, and, and I wanna say Asante Sana Kofense and uh, for uh, having uh, me here today and for all the work that you've done in our community. Um, uh, over the years, and that's been insurmountable amount of work from educating people to bringing us beautiful music. So, Sante San. You know what? And I'm sorry, I got slightly elated and kind of went out of the order. There's a couple of things I wanted to do before okay. we delve into the uh, discussion. I wanted to read read a brief intro no. on Malcolm X, and then and. It's a little late, uh, uh, elongated, but I think it helps to provide a perfect context for understanding the importance of Malcolm X. And that's the eulogy that was read at his funeral by mm. Isaac Davis. So uh, Malcolm X was born Malcolm Little, later El Haj Malik El Shabazz on May the 19th in 1925. And he was assassinated February the 21st in 1965. And I'd like to also add that he also took an African name, Omawali, which means child who has returned home. He was an, he was an uh, African-American Muslim minister and a human rights activist who was a prominent figure during the civil rights movement. A spokesman for the Nation of Islam until 1964, he was a vocal advocate for black power and black empowerment and the promotion of Islam within the black community. A posthumously autobiography on which he collaborated with Malcolm X with excuse me with Alex Haley was published in 1965. <clears throat> now this for me is a very moving introduction or overview of the importance of Malcolm X and this is the eulogy that was presented by Ossie Davis who who was a, a revolutionary in his own right so we honor him as well and this was read at the funeral February the 27th in 1965. Here at this final hour in this quiet place, Harlem has come 
to bid farewell to one of his brightest hopes, extinguished now and gone from us forever. For Hallam is where he worked and where he struggled and fought, his home of homes where his heart was and where his people are. And it is therefore most fitting that we meet once again in Harlem to share these last moments with him. For Harlem was ever, Harlem has ever been gracious to those who have loved her, have fought for her, and have defended her honor even to the death. It is not in the memory of the ma of a man that this beleaguered, unfortunate, but nonetheless proud community has found a braver, more gallant young champion than, than this Afro-American who lies before us unconquered still. I say the word as he would want me to, Afro-American, Afro-American Malcolm, who was a master, who was a master, was most meticulous in his use of words. Nobody knew better than he the power words have over minds over the minds of men. Malcolm had stopped being a Negro many years ago. It had become too small, too puny, too weak a word for him. Malcolm was bigger than that. Malcolm had become an Afro-American and he wanted so desperately that we all, all his people would become Afro-Americans Afro as well. There are those who will consider it their duty as friends of the Negro people to tell us to revile him, to flee, even from the presence of his memory, to save ourselves by writing him out of the history of our turbulent times. Malcolm, many will ask what Harlem, many will ask what Harlem finds to honor in this stormy controversy on bold young captain. And we will smile. Many will, many will say, turn away, away from this man, for he is not a man, but a demon, a monster, a subverter, and an enemy of the black man. And we will smile. They will say that he is of hate, a fanatic, a racist, who can only bring evil to the cause for which you struggle. And we will answer and say to them, did you ever know Malcolm? Did you ever talk to Malcolm? Did you ever touch him or even smile? Did you ever touch him or have him smile at you? Did you ever really listen to him? Did he ever do a mean thing? Was he ever associated with violence or any public dis disturbance? For if you did, you would know. And if you knew him, you would know why, mo why we must honor him. Malcolm was our manhood, our living black manhood. This was his meaning to his people. And in honoring him, we honor the best in ourselves. Last year from Africa, he wrote these words to a friend. Quote, my journey, he says, is almost ended, and I have a much broader scope than when I started out, which I believe will add new life and dimensions to our struggle for freedom and honor and dignity in the States. I am writing these things so that you will know for a fact the tremendous sympathy and support we have among the African states for our human rights struggle. The main thing is that we keep a united front wherein our most valuable time and energy will not be wasted fighting each other. However, we may have differed with him or with each other about him and his value as a man. Let, us, let, uh, let his going from us serve only to bring us together now. Consigning these mortal remains, the common mother of all, excuse me, Consigning these mortal remains to earth, the common mother of all, secure in the knowledge that what we place in the ground is no more now a man, but a seed, which after the winter of our discontent will come forth again to meet us. And we will know him then for what he was and is, a prince, our own black shining prince, who didn't hesitate to die because he loved us so. And I thank I see Davis for that. And... Uh, now, Mama Shoshana, if you can maybe talk about your earliest introduction to uh, Malcolm X's life and his work. Oh, wow, that was beautiful, Kofense, uh, Sante Sana for that. Um, yeah, my earliest introduction, I'm sure I may have heard some negative um, utterance about uh, Malcolm um, when I was a child, but um, my uh, introduction to Malcolm X was through my two older brothers, Chokwe Lumumba and Arki Shakua, um, who uh, brought uh, myself and my sister Itari into the Republic of New Africa in um, the end of 1968. 
Um, and there we were uh, introduced to Republic of New Africa. And I think uh, we kind of were made to go to <laughs> nation building classes. And um, there, uh, Dr. Imari Open Daily uh, taught the classes and also Gahidi, uh, attorney Milton Henry. Um, so they uh, would talk about uh, Malcolm. Uh, they, uh, from my memory, is that the Republic of New Africa was founded on Malcolm X's principles on uh, that he had given us on his teachings and on his beliefs. And uh, we were following these things. Our um, Declaration of Independence of the RNA was based on it. Um, the first time I read the book, the autobiography of Malcolm X, I remember uh, Malik was that um, I got it from Ed Vaughn's bookstore. Um, and um, I, I was so excited to take that book home and, and read it. Um, so that was my introduction to Malcolm. Dr. Henderson. Uh, appreciate, appreciate the invitation and, and appreciate all the folks who, uh, who come here. Uh, to your question, uh, as uh, I first became aware of, of, of Minister Malcolm at an elementary school, I was uh, I was I was given a book to, to read that I thought was the autobiography, but it was really uh, a collection of his speeches because I had read most of the books in our um, in the library for my age. It was by Miss um, Brown, my fourth grade uh, teacher at Foster Elementary School in the Brewster Projects. But it, it had been inculcated in my from my parents. Um, 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 my mother was from Birmingham, Alabama. My father was from St. Anne's Bay, Jamaica, uh, who had taught us. So I learned much about black liberation. But I didn't understand it. I didn't understand any of it. Um, but and we had a black history contest in elementary school. So much of it was just knowing the names. But I didn't. I didn't understand it. My two oldest siblings, uh, as the 60s progressed, the oldest boy was a Marine in Vietnam, and my oldest sister was working with the Black Panther Party in Detroit. Um, but there were a lot of folks who are um, associated with revolutionary organizations that had come through the Brewster Projects that, uh, again, as, 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 a, as a child, uh, I was exposed to them, but I didn't understand any of that. I didn't begin to understand it till I got to high school and that, um, and especially uh, at 17 when I joined the the army, and in the in the U.S. South, that's where I started reading uh, uh, Minister Malcolm, and um, and started to understand the things that I had uh, uh, I had been exposed to early. But <laughs> one of the reasons I was in the U.S. Army because I hadn't taken heed to them, and I had um, and I really had no place else to go. <laughs> It's kind of <laughs> ironic, but people who understand, people who know, know that uh, my parents had to sign for me to join the army, but they thought it would be, uh, my life's chances would be better in the army at 17, the 17 year old in the Brewster Project uh, in Detroit at that time. Yeah. So uh, I, I, wanna, I wanna give credit to the folks who, 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 who exposed me to it, but I also want to acknowledge that I didn't understand it when I, when I was. And it's really not until I was a, uh, in high school that I began to, but I'm sorry, I right out of high school in the, the military that I began to. Uh, and it's interesting how you can be in those kind of situations and um, to, you can come together around a lot of older people who were schooling me in the military who had um, reinforced those things uh, uh, for me. So th that's my introduction. Baba Malik. Uh, so first of all, thank you, Dr. Chike, for the invitation. Uh, it's an honor to serve on this panel with Sister Shoshana, who I have known for most of my life and who I love and respect as a long-term activist. She, she embodies the kind of long-term dedication that we need to achieve liberation. And it's an honor to be on this panel with Dr. Henderson, who in my estimation is one of the most brilliant scholar activists who has emerged from Detroit in the last several decades. Mm. Um, so my earliest recollection of Malcolm X was actually on a Sunday in 1965, Sunday, February 21st, when uh, announced on the radio, it was announced on the radio that Malcolm X was killed. And I remember my parents kind of mentioning it. And I heard it. I didn't know who Malcolm was at that time. 
Uh, you know, I remember seeing Brothers in the Nation in the barbershop selling the newspaper, but I was nine years old. And so, you know, I was much more concerned about toy guns and, you know, all that kind of thing than I was about politics at that time. But uh, the the reintrodu the real introduction to Malcolm X for me occurred in 1969, January of 1969. I was attending post junior high school and I had two teachers to whom I will forever be indebted. Uh, one was named Ronald McCombs and the other is named Melvin Peters. Ronald McCombs has been an ancestor for uh, more than 30 years now. Dr. Peters fortunately is still with us and recently retired from Michigan State University. Uh, but these two brothers were both from West Virginia and had moved to Detroit in the um, 60, 66, 67, around that time period. Uh, Detroit, you know, kind of had an allure for many black folks from throughout the country. And they moved here and had been here for a few years and they, they were both uh, highly politically conscious. And so it was interesting to have these two childhood friends teaching in the same school. Ronald McCombs was my eighth grade social studies teacher and Melvin Peters was my eighth grade uh, English teacher. They sometimes used to combine their classes together and either have guest speakers or show movies and things like that. And of course they were trying to politicize us. But uh, on one occasion they gathered us together, the two classes, and they played the entire LP recording of Malcolm X's message to the grassroots. And for me in many ways, that's a line of demarcation in my life. Um, I, I don't wanna use the terminology, I was born again at that point, but certainly <laughs> it uh, changed the way I looked at myself and it changed the way I looked at the world and it set me on a trajectory that I've been on ever since. Uh, so at the time I was 13 and, you know, 13 year old black boys in Detroit in 1969, you know, and probably still today, you know, we're trying to kind of figure out what does manhood mean, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, this is in the context of, you know, all the kind of images that existed in 1969 of, of what black manhood could be. And so for me, there was a very kind of personal draw that Malcolm had because I was, you know, searching for what it meant to be a black man. And in many ways, Malcolm for me embodied that. Uh, both his fearlessness, his uh, ability to articulate our condition and the global condition that we find ourselves in and um, his ad ad advocacy of self-defense as a 13 year old, all of those things appealed to me tremendously and myself and most of my peers at that time wanted to be like Mel. Okay, I want to back up a little bit. Thank you all. Um, Mama Shoshana, you mentioned the, the RNA or the Republic of New Africa. And that organization is, in my opinion, is a very important link to Malcolm X's life and philosophy, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the Republic of New, Afri of New Africa was born in some ways out of an organization called the Malcolm X Gun, Gun Club, which mm -hmm. included uh, uh, Richard and Milton Henry, mm -hmm. Gaidi and uh, Imari Obadeli, the Henry brothers. Can you say a little more about the, the RNA in terms of what its mission was as it related to Malcolm? Okay. Well, I know that the Republic of New Africa was founded in 1968 by uh, the Henry brothers, as well as Queen um, Oddly Moore. We called her Queen Mother Moore, uh, Robert Williams, um, who was the first president of um, the Republic of New Africa. And... Um, there were other people like Betty Shabazz. Betty Shabazz was one of the um, signers of the Declaration of Independence, Malcolm's wife. Um, actually, um, uh, the brother, uh, okay, I'm having a, a senior moment now, but um, our brother who um, helped develop Kwanzaa. Um, Karanga, thank you. Um, he was also uh, one of uh, the founders of the Republic of New Africa. So people would be surprised who uh, 
got together and uh, founded the uh, Republican New Africa and wrote uh, the in the, uh, Declaration of Independence. And um, it was founded um, from my understanding um, because we believed that uh, we were a nation of people, um, not just an organization, but a nation because we had a common culture, a common language, um, you know, the things, and I'm sure Dr. Henderson could probably uh, re uh, relate more on it, but everything that a nation is supposed to have, um, but we were without our land, okay? That's what the Republic of New Africa was all about, to um, get our land um, to free our nation. And then the provisional government of the Republic of New Africa would be the organizing body of, of that group. And so we were known as a separatist group. Um, there was no hatred. I, I didn't really meet any um, brothers and sisters in there that hated white people or any other people, just like Malcolm. Um, there, what we hated was the racism. We hated the lack of control that we had over our people and, and over our land. But w the separatism came is because we wanted to own, control, and govern our own people and our own land. So that was the my understanding of the purpose of the creation. Uh, and development of the Republic of Africa. And there were five states that were designated um, for that purpose. Um, I know Mississippi was one, uh, North Carolina, um, uh, uh, Georgia. Um, let's see. Okay. Louisiana. South Carolina, Shoshana. South Carolina. Okay. Louisiana. What was the fifth one? South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. Okay, thank you. And actually, see see why I need you, brothers? <laughs> see, and actually, we did move into those areas of the land, um, you know, those states. We did. You know, we were able to go, get that far. But along the way with the Republican Africa, and I don't know how far you want me to go with it, but, you know, just like the Black Panther Party, we suffered the... Um, intervention and of COINTELPRO, the FBI and, and the police law enforcement departments where they came gunning for our people. And, um, you know, there was the big shootout um, in, in, in down there in uh, Jackson, Mississippi, where they, the police uh, came in, in wee hours of the morning and uh, to the offices of the Republic of Africa, similar like they did with our brother Fred Hampton in the Black Panther Party, going in there in the middle of the night, shooting everybody up. Well, they did that to the Republic of New Africa's office, but they got a big surprise because the brothers and sisters were awake and they got shot up, okay? And some of them ended up dying. That's what happened. But then they sent uh, 11 of our people to prison, including Dr. Imari Opadeli, who was at home in his bed, wasn't even present at that time. But um, yeah, so, you know, that's the Republic of Africa. We fought for our land. The Republic's, uh, the provisional governor still, government still exists today. Um, still have intentions of uh, building and developing um, the nation. And I still consider myself a citizen of the Republic of Africa because it is not an organization, like I said, it is a nation. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, there was an and the, the the Republic of New Africa, if I'm not mistaken, was founded in Detroit. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, yeah. I think an, another organization, and maybe you could help me out on this, uh, Baba Malik, the Pan African Congress, which I know you were a part of, did it have? Uh, connections to the philosophy or ideology of Malcolm X? And could you say a little bit about the organization? Yeah, for sure. And maybe I'll preface by saying that uh, at least three of the major Black nationalist organizations in Detroit all kind of came out of the same uh, pool of people in a sense. Uh, so um, Shoshana mentioned Imari and uh, Gaidi Obadele who were members of Reverend Clegg's church. 
uh, Kwame Atta and uh, Ed Vaughn, who were two of the founders of the Pan-African Congress, were also members of Reverend Clegg's church. And of course, the church itself evolved into what we now know as the Pan-African Orthodox Christian Church. So I just want to point out the connection that existed. And in a sense, all of those organizations came from the same uh, fountainhead. But uh, for sure, the Pan-African Congress was influenced by uh, Malcolm's activities, certainly in the last year of his life. Uh, most of the last year of his life was spent on the African continent. And he, uh, he advised us to internationalize our struggle. Uh, as many people know, uh, he did not define our struggle as a civil rights struggle. And I, it, it kind of uh, bothers me, even in your introduction, you kind of said he was active during the civil rights era. And I see many things now where they're defining Malcolm as a civil, right, civil rights leader, and he certainly didn't define himself that way. But he, uh, you know, he defined our struggle as a struggle for human rights and uh, wanted to take our struggle to the international stage. And so that emphasis on taking our struggle to the international stage, particularly to the African continent, influenced the development of the Pan-African Congress and most of the energies of the Pan-African Congress were geared towards the objective of uh, unifying and creating socialism in, in, in the African continent. Uh, and I'd like to add one thing I didn't do earlier. Some people may be wondering, well, how does Malcolm X tie into Juneteenth? Mm -hmm. and, and maybe we could get into that a little bit. But uh, And I think Juneteenth means different things to different people. For me, I, I think it is uh, worthy of celebration, but it also, the, the whole Juneteenth celebration in some ways came into existence because some people either forgot or intentionally made it a point to not let know some of our people know that we have been free or emancipated in quotation marks. And as I reflect on you all and what I know about you all and other people like you all to do this work, this there's a concept of the long liberation struggle. So Juneteenth, if you see it as a victory or as a, mo a monumental point in our history, is a part of a continuum of battles or victories. And I just wanted to kind of provide a, a, a context, a context for that, uh, you know, earlier an earlier program we had uh, Dr. Ryan Brown and uh, Dr. Roth uh, do a presentation and an interpretation or an analysis of uh, Dr. King's uh, letter from the Birmingham Birmingham jail, which this is a, this year is the 60th anniversary. But all these people, Dr. King, or if we go back even further to Juneteenth, people that. Frederick Douglass was around during that time June, of Juneteenth, Harriet Tubman. For many of us, this, this is a continuum. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to uh, say a little bit about that. Uh, <clears throat> could you, uh, or uh, Robert Earl, did you have a comment in terms of some of the early organizations that built upon or were influenced by the work of Malcolm X? And I, I think the Black Panther Party or Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale, who were among the founders, were inspired by Malcolm X as well. And it helped lead to the foundation of the Black Panther Party. But did you did you have something to contribute to that, uh, Bobby? Aaron? Well, sure. If, if you like, um, uh, Malcolm, of course, his own organization, the organization of Afro-American Unity, would be uh, first. Uh, the Nation of Islam, of course, re rejected uh, Malcolm's thesis. They were looking at more theological definitions for revolution. And Minister Malcolm was talking about actual revolution. That's what message of the grassroots is so significant in November 1963, delivered in Detroit. But also his two subsequent renditions of the Ballad of the Bullet in Cleveland and in Detroit. Um, and that's uh, important because it's important to appreciate the breadth of Minister Malcolm as not only a, a revolutionary, but a revolutionary theorist and strategist. So as Malcolm says in Message of the Grassroots, the revolutions are bloody. They're based on land by the Ballad of the Bullet the next year. He says, America's in a unique position. She's the only country in history in a position actually to become involved in a bloodless revolution. So how do you reconcile the two? Revolution bloody is bloodless revolution. Well, Malcolm differentiated between what he called political and cultural revolution. 
Um, he also uh, appreciated the need for uh, armed struggle, but he also appreciated the need for electoral struggle. So he had gone south. He'd been on programs with uh, Miss Fannie Lou Hamer. So this is the breadth of Malcolm. So I say that in order to preface this point I'm about to make. So uh, Malcolm influences a young uh, uh, Muhammad Ahmed, Max Sanford, and Wanda Marshall to uh, develop the Revolutionary Action Movement. Revolutionary Action Movement, for folks who are not as familiar, they're the Panthers before the Panthers. Uh, even their trajectory from their, um, all the way from Black nationalism to Maoism. Uh, 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 resembles that. And of course, uh, those in, uh, in, in 1965, both the US organization and the Black Panther Party, and the US organization just want to say something because one of its uh, most important leaders uh, just uh, passed, James M. Toomey. Uh, James M. Toomey is uh, the, 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 people who know him, he's a Grammy Award winning uh, uh, performer and writer, uh, wrote The Close I Get to You. Of course, Juicy, that, uh, that big example. But that's James and Toomey. But Toomey is also the co-editor with Clyde Galisi of the 1967's Quotable Coringa. He's a part of US organization. And it's important for people to appreciate that US organization doesn't begin or end with Molana Coringa. So James and Toomey, they just dedicated a street to him in his hometown of Philly. He also was a, a world-class swimmer. He was a backstroker. <laughs> that's him Toomey, OK? Anyway, that's US organization, 1965 in Watts, uh, the Black Panther Party, in uh, the, the one in Oakland in 1966. Of course, they, uh, oh, I'm sorry, US is also co founded by uh, Hakeem Jamal, who was Malcolm's uh, cousin, if I remember correctly, by marriage. So, this is Malcolm's influence. They see themselves as building on uh, Malcolm X. Ram does, US does, of course, the Black Panther Party of Huey Newton and Bobby Seale, um, but also the ones that uh, come after, uh, definitely the, uh, the Republic of New Africa. You have what's called the Malcolm X Doctrine in the Republic of New Africa. The Congress of African People under uh, Amiria Amina Baraka uh, self-consciously uh, uh, associate themselves with Minister Malcolm. Baraka leaves Greenwich Village and goes to set up the uh, uh, what becomes the foundational organization of the Black Arts Movement called BARTS in Harlem after Malcolm's assassination. Uh, this is the influence of Minister Malcolm. Now we're into Black, uh, black art. Uh, of course, Reverend Cleese uh, Shrine of Black Madonna as well, but also the League of Revolutionary Black Workers in Detroit as well. Mm -hmm. These are this is a Marxist organization. Malcolm wasn't a Marxist, right? uh, but this is the breadth of Minister Malcolm from uh, revolutionary uh, 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 activism to uh, uh, electoral politics. Also, remember Malcolm Malcolm's uh, a working class religious guy. You see. <laughs> So, so also for many of those who find efficacy in the in the not only in the mosque but in the church as well. So this is the breadth. When you say Malcolm's influence, these are this is the breadth, and these are just some of the more notable organizations. Definitely not uh, uh, a full list of them. So I stop there. Well, thanks. You didn't have to stop. We appreciate all the information that you have. And uh, so uh, another thing that I know that you all have in common along with being activists is that you are our educators so could you maybe say a little about how uh the teachings philosophy and life of malcolm x has influenced your teaching and or influenced influenced you as a teacher if you could maybe go first mama shashana i'd appreciate it okay thank you um and as a um high school teacher in detroit uh for 21 years um I would say that, um, you know, without the influence of, of Malcolm X uh, and, 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 uh, and those that came after him, I don't think I would have been the effective um, teacher that I was and uh, the influence that, uh, positive influence that I, I've, I've had on some of my students. And I'm not uh, boasting. I'm, I'm going by my students who have, um, I've, I've somewhat been able to realize my successes through them. And to give you a real live example is um, my student, um, Dr. Uh, L. Uh, H Hakeem, uh, and, and, and Malik helped me, I don't wanna mess up his name. <laughs> But he has the Black History Mobile. He has this. He, oh, he yeah. Dr. Collett. Collett. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Collett. And Dr. Collett 
because um, you know, I I had him back in. Uh, he was my student. He graduated in 1980, not to tell his age, but in the 80s. Okay, and um, so he created this amazing Black History Mobile that travels. It started traveling city to st city, then uh, state to state. And then he, he, he told me that he's been out of the country with it. He's going international with it. And he always remind me, of, even though I was his um, literature teacher, English teacher, he reminds me of me teaching him about Malcolm because I always did. And, and, and the rest of you uh, uh, educators, you know that you know, uh, history and literature inter is intertwined. You can't uh, leave out one without the other. So um, he reminds me that that was one of the things early on, and he has some other awesome, great teachers after me, right? So Malcolm's influence did that. My brothers and Dr. Amari Opadeli um, and Gahidi introduced me to Malcolm, right? And then I introduced my students to Malcolm. And, and, and just one other real short story I want to share. I had a young man, uh, two young men at Mumford that um, didn't want to do their uh, senior uh, book report. And um, the book list that they had, they didn't, you know, weren't interested in the books. Plus, they weren't that much interested in doing work. But I knew both of these young men were really um, brilliant young men and they were capable of doing the work. So I added to that book list, right? And I added um, the autobiography of Malcolm X that was not on there and also added the man child, um, a prom the man child yeah, promise, the land. promise land. Right. Uh, Claude Brown. Is and, um, get, and those young men ended up re reading those books, doing the book reports, getting uh, excellent grades. And one of them, um, I saw him years later, uh, he was an engineer, right? And these were guys that were goofing off in school, didn't you know, want to do the work. So I know Malcolm influenced me and I know I was able to take Malcolm's teachings and teach uh, my students and it influenced them. So thank you for letting me share that. And you know what you just said reminds me about Malcolm's life, who we know from the autobiography that he was a brilliant young man mm -hmm. that due to circum so, social economic conditions was kind of led away from his brilliance. And I just think about young men like the ones that you mentioned and so many people that I have encountered that said when they read that book, it turn them around uh malik baba malik or baba errol did you uh want to maybe tell us how uh the philosophy teachings and life of malcolm x may have informed your uh you as an educator okay dr henderson you want to go first oh sure um uh, this line this is from minister malcolm himself and i, I never forgot that i discovered it at a for myself at um, Wayne State, uh, yeah. So I was, um, when I was 20, I, I found this at Wayne State. This is Malcolm, he says, we need new ideas, new methods, new approaches. We will call upon young students of political science throughout the nation to help us. We will encourage these young students to launch their own independent study and give us their analysis and their suggestions. I took that to heart. That's why I became a political science major and a political scientist now. But to develop Malcolm's revolutionary thesis, to not treat Malcolm's thesis as a finished product, but a point of departure for us to develop. For example, I said Malcolm talked about political revolution, but it's very fluid. He had not developed his thesis on cultural revolution, which is the last part, of, is what he was focusing on the last part of his, um, the last year of his life. Manny Marble doesn't even mention it in, in, in his book. So the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the book I finished in 2019, The Revolution Not Be Theorized, it starts with Minister Malcolm as a point of departure. And it's theorizing Malcolm and it's and my basic premise is that look here, as black folks, we were four million in 1860. We're 40 million now. We didn't get here, get here through the good graces of white people. We got here because black folks, but black folks who strategized, theorized, made programs. But often when we get to the point where we got to talk about strategy and theory, the same black folks will go find some white person to then give them the theory for their own liberation. 
I'm not opposed to studying wherever you want to study. Or they'll get some non-black person. Let me just say that. Because they don't have to be white. But non-black person. But uh, And I teach international relations. But to look at our folks as theorists and strategists as well, and it starts with Minister Malcolm. And I often say, if Malcolm could have seen Watts, if he could have seen Watts, he was looking for revolutionary examples abroad, but the example was right under his feet, which is the Black Revolution of the U.S. Civil War, which is which is a uh, which is mystified today. It's not taught today, but Du Bois talked about it in 1935. We talked about uh, the, what he called the general strike, but it was more than the general strike. It was a revolution. I don't use that as a metaphor. So Malcolm looked at looking abroad. I ain't mad at him. I understand why. As you read Malcolm's uh, his uh, diary, you can see Malcolm is already seeing how many of the so-called revolutionary leaders, I shouldn't say so-called, they're revolutionary leaders, they were mostly not supporting Malcolm. They just opposed the United States. When Malcolm posed his own program, you'll see the folks who leave him. And Malcolm's hip to it. As you read, this was edited by uh, Detroit Herb Boyd and Ilyasha, uh, Malcolm's daughter, and Haki published this um, a couple years ago. This is Malcolm's diary. Okay, um, um, so what I what I attempt to do, I don't attempt to do it, I do it. I bring in Malcolm as a theorist and a strategist of black liberation, but building on his work, his strengths and his weaknesses. It's not personal. I'm not a historian. I'm not interested in who he was sleeping with, who he's going home with. I'm interested in his, his, his theory of revolutionary struggle and how to build on it. And that's what some of these people that we've been talking about before have been attempting to do, okay, and have done. But this is part of why I make Malcolm relevant today. And the last thing I'll say is, in a context where we should appreciate what a cultural revolution is, this is one of the biggest things that's missing from the present movement. Wonderful movement, a global movement of Black Lives Matter. But a theory to guide. Once it gets the gear theory, they're not talking about Black folks anymore. But they think they're posing a theory for Black liberation. So Malcolm is a useful point of departure. Point of departure, the starting point, not the end up. Thank you for that, Baba Malik. Yeah, thank you, uh, Brother Henderson and Sister Shoshana. Mm -hmm. um, so a as Brother Henderson said, you know, Malcolm certainly a advocated a cultural revolution that that was a necessary prerequisite for obtaining the kind of political power that, uh, that he wanted to see us obtain. He understood that we had to change the way we see ourselves and in fact, you know, one of the famous quotes by Malcolm, he said, well, who taught you to hate yourself? And so he really, you know, kind of hammered on this, that we needed to reverse this self-hatred that we had been indoctrinated with. And we needed an education, which was a liberatory uh, education and, and a, a cultural revolution generally. And as he evolved, we even saw his appearance uh, evolve as he embraced more strongly the concepts of a cultural revolution, he began to, you know, as and also in all fairness, as he uh, distanced himself from the nation of Islam, he began to grow a beard and we see pictures of him in Ghana wearing, you know, traditional clothing. And as you mentioned, he took the Nigerian name Omawale. Uh, so he began to exhibit this in his personal life as well. Um, but also Malcolm wrote a book early on, or, or at least I don't know if he wrote it or people just compiled quotes from him on Afro-American history. And as a youngster, as a 13 year old, that was part of what we were reading uh, because at that point we knew very little, most of us knew very little about our history and Malcolm understood that it was necessary for us to have a profound understanding of our own history in order to develop the ideas that would lead our liberation movement. And Malcolm says something, I'm paraphrasing, that if you, if you, teach people how to think and they, you know, they have the information, they'll come up with the solution themselves. And so he was advocating for another type of education. And I, I wanna also make the distinction as brother uh, Wale Mushuja did, I wanna make the distinction between education and schooling because Malcolm X was not schooled. He was highly educated, but he was not highly educated because he attended uh, traditional academies. And so, um, so I just want to, you know, kind of add that nuance to it as well. And, you know, you mentioned liberatory education. Uh, there were two major educational movements that emerged in the late 60s. That was the Black Studies Movement and also the African Centered Education Movement, which for me, having done some research on both, 
see those as uh, sister or parallel movements. Could you say, uh, and I'd like you to address this, Baba Malik, what the connections may be between the philosophy and teachings of Malcolm X and the uh, African-centered education movement, which we all know you were a, a major part of. You know, I, and not to reduce our history to one person, but I think in many ways, both of those movements are an extension of Malcolm's teaching and life. life. Mm -hmm. um, and both of them, I think, embraced the call that Malcolm put out to us to, um, to begin to, to, you know, to study our own history, uh, to study our own struggle for liberation and to advance ideas that would move us towards self-determination. So I think the same is true for Black Studies and for the African Center Education Movement. He also, I wish I had this quote I had prepared, but there's a quote that he makes, and maybe you are someone can uh, may notice more, uh, about the importance of people educating themselves as opposed to having other people educate their children. So I think that's in line with that, what you said as well. Mama Shoshana, you look like you wanted to. Yeah, I, I just wanted to interject a point, if I, I may, because you brought me um, a, a memory to me. Um, when you were asking about our, you know, um, kind of influence um, on, edu you know, as educators um, with Malcolm's teaching. And I thought of, um, you know, my brother, our brother, Shokwe Lumumba, and he is about the, the best personal example I know, you know, um, outside of my students, my show Quay um, dropped out of law school, right? With, when the RNA, when they had the shootout um, with, with the, you know, when the police invaded their office and he, after, you know, finishing up the first year of law school at the top of his class, he dropped out because he went down to Mississippi to, defend, you know, work on the cases with the attorneys who were assigned the case. And um, he was not thinking about going back to law school. He said he went back to law school because he wanted to be the lawyer that Malcolm X wanted to be. And we all remember when we read about Malcolm's story, the his teacher, his racist teacher, told him, you know, he, you can't be a, a lawyer, Malcolm. You need to think about being something else. What did they tell him he should be? Be a janitor. Or, right. Be a janitor. So, but certainly not a lawyer. So he, Malcolm said that he wanted to be a lawyer. Cho Kwe did become the lawyer. And I think um, that he became the lawyer that Malcolm X could have been, right? And with that, influence from Malcolm on Chokwe, he was able to be a phenomenal lawyer. So I think that's a good example of uh, Malcolm's influence. And can, we, hey, can, I, can I add one other point to this conversation? And that is that in spite of the significant differences that Malcolm had with the Nation of Islam in the later part of his life, he was still highly influenced by the teachings of the Nation of Islam. And as you know, from your own research, Early on, the Nation of Islam started schools in order to teach our people at least what they conceived as being our true history. And so, again, I, I don't want to reduce it to Malcolm as a single individual because he was influenced by various factors as well. Right. But when I asked the question, I wasn't trying to make him contextualize him as like the ideologue. I just wanted to kind of right. get your opinion on how he influenced because uh, African-centered education, a lot of the principles like separatism or like nationalism, mm -hmm. independence, the importance of knowing your own history, all of these were parts of that movement. So I wasn't suggesting that he was like the sole mm -hmm. source of that movement. And it's important that we know and understand just as I talked about Juneteenth or the life of Malcolm X or the uh, victory of Juneteenth, if we can call it that, or the fact that there were brothers still fighting against those that were trying to keep us enslaved. Malcolm's life uh, for me is a part of a continuum mm -hmm. because the same continuum, because he 
was influenced by his father, both his parents who were Garveyites. Mm -hmm. And we know that Marcus Garvey had a similar impact that Malcolm had during his time. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, where do we go? We, we're down to about the last five minutes, but I like to mention to those that are viewing us, we, I, we do welcome uh, questions or comments you like to have. We will take those in a couple of minutes. Unfortunately, the format we in won't allow us to have direct dialogue, but we will engage your questions. Uh, how do you see the influence or the impact of Malcolm X playing out? And you made a reference to Black Lives Matter and some contemporary struggles that are going on now amongst young people. Uh, how do you see the influence of, do you see that Malcolm X life philosophy influenced uh, young activists today? And I, I have to apologize because I was prompted to bring some younger people into this discussion and I just was not able to make it happen in time. So do you all have any thoughts about connections or parallels between his teachings and ideology, or maybe even a message to young revolutionaries and uh, activists today? Well, before the, they, my brothers respond, I, I just want to say have part two of today so you can, um, you know, bring, um, you know, maybe bring some of us back and bring a, a, a younger uh, um, panelist, you know, back. Well, you know, it's interesting that you said that because I, I, I think it's this weekend, but I may not have the exact date, but African Liberation Day mm -hmm. is coming up. And one of the programs they're having is an intergenerational dialogue oh. between generations. So I think they're, they're promoted. They have about eight people and the, the panelists are going to range from the age of 15 to 80. And I think one of the things that has been a problem or a challenge for us is not having an intergenerational approach to this mm -hmm. movement that we've been involved in. Uh, we do have one question, <clears throat> uh, and it, it reads, is it time for a holiday like Dr. King? So I guess that what is meant by this, is it time that we make Malcolm X birthday a holiday? Mm -hmm. And... I would like to add, for those of you that choose to respond to that, if you could maybe see a little bit or say a little about the co-optation, the commodification, and the misrepresentation of what Malcolm is or has been post his life. Mm -hmm. Hopefully the question makes sense. So. You can, Malik, would you like to take yeah, a start? I'll start and say that I'm not really very concerned or supportive of trying to get the United States government to declare Malcolm X's birthday a holiday. It's already a holiday. Mm -hmm. It's been a holiday among black people, you know, since mm -hmm. he was assassinated. <laughs> and we, you know, we, the fact that we're having this speaks to the fact that we see it as a holiday. So right. we can legitimate things on our own without having the U.S. government to declare it to be so. But I think since Malcolm died, there's been a struggle to claim Malcolm and to project what his ideology would have been had he lived. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, the, some of the, you know, he spoke for the Social Workers Party a few times. And of course, they're claiming that had he lived, that, you know, he would have been more ideologically aligned with their position um, in his book, uh, Black Christian Nationalism, uh, Reverend. Clegg Jeremoji of Baby Ajiman, um, and I'm paraphrasing, but said had Malcolm lived, he would have kind of arrived at the same place that Black Christian Nationalists arrived at. And many other folks have attempted to kind of claim uh, Malcolm's legacy. And so as we move farther in time away from the time he actually lived on the earth, we see more and more of that. Uh, and we do certainly uh, have the danger of misinterpretation and co-optation of his uh, of his message, right. And and before Dr. Henderson responds to that, I just want to uh, agree with um, Baba Malik. I 
I don't see a, a, a purpose for uh, making Malcolm's holiday, uh, um, you know, giving Malcolm a holiday. Uh, Malcolm, I don't think, would have wanted a holiday. Malcolm would have wanted a revolution. Malcolm would want change and putting his picture on a stamp and everybody closing down the banks on a Monday for Malcolm, uh, I don't think would be the way Malcolm would want to be paid tribute to. That's me. Thank you. Baba Earl? No, I don't have a problem with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you have a <laughs> Do you have a comment? Um, okay, the, the influence of Malcolm, uh, I, I, I think my connection went out a couple of times. The influence of Malcolm, when Malcolm's talking about cultural revolution and then when Cruz and others, he's not talking about aesthetic, simply aesthetic thing. He's talking about controlling cultural systems. So one of them would be capturing the cultural apparatus of the society, which is largely media. Um, Cruz builds on Malcolm in this way to, to capture media. Imagine this, to uh, look at the salience of media, just like he helped develop the medium of the, of the Muhammad Speaks. In an era of social media, folks are asking the relevance of Malcolm because they don't study Malcolm as a theorist. You let a thousand flowers bloom. Um, um, it's, it's not that the next generation will not see Malcolm the way other older folks have. So a holiday may stimulate them to see the contradiction in the hypocrisy of the U.S. talking about a holiday, and then you go actually read Malcolm. And then, oh, my goodness, it becomes a basis for mobilizing. Malcolm's relevance is seen today in the discussion of reparations, uh, which, which he brought Queen Mother Moore to, to the mosque to discuss reparations. Um, so it's, it's a question of how we mobilize. Often, and I think too often, when folks talk about revolution, they look at it as a finished product. It's the process to get you to that. So when you see people like uh, Sister Bree Nelson go up and take that Confederate flag down, you see, that's a cultural claim. Just like reparations are a cultural claim that's going to become economic and political. But back to Sister Bree. When she brings it down, cultural claim, don't have the Confederacy up there, right? Then the next question is, who put it there? <laughs> who voted for it to be there on a uh, state uh, at, at a municipal building? Well, now that becomes a political one. The cultural issue has ramified, spilled over to the political. And that's who funded this thing? Not because of an economic thing. Malcolm was, why does Malcolm go and become involved in electoral politics? He did one under the illusion that uh, there was going to be a revolution there, but it's a process to get you there and to develop faith and community that will help take you there. Because it's like the sister said, wonderful sister Asha Bandelli once said, she said, if I don't, if I don't have faith, if I'm not comfortable leaving my purse with you, I'm not making revolution with you. So you develop fellowships across different kinds of struggles. That's why there's a movement in the streets today that's international. Black Lives Matter. There's a Black Lives Matter movement in Nigeria. So not even talking about the ones in France, England, etc. How do you make the, the movement, just like Malcolm talking about the civil rights movement, how do you make that movement revolutionary? He's not saying religion is revolutionary. It's not. The issue is, under what condition can religion be made to be revolutionary? These are the things Malcolm left to us, is to utilize whatever we have to move toward, not revolution as an objective. The objective is social justice. It's not revolution for revolution's sake, but Malcolm differentiated between a cultural revolution, why? For people who are denied their culture, who face death to learn to read and write, you need to study culture just to even know that you got basic human rights claim. Our claim for our labor was a human rights claim. We couldn't claim our own labor. We had to claim our humanity to get our own labor, which is, another, which is one of the struggles that many folks have in this country with women's reproductive rights. You see, our productive rights are geared to our, our humanity. In a patriarchal society, women's humanity would be denied so they won't be respected for having even their reproductive rights in their own body. You see what I'm saying? But Malcolm, he's talking about Cultural revolution as a precursor to political revolution. Lenin said a similar thing in a post-revolutionary environment. Mao said something, but that's not what Malcolm was talking about. What did he mean, Errol? Well, he didn't develop it. Like King, he was killed before he was 40 years old. Five members of the Nation of Islam assassinated him before he developed that. His last, years of, his last year of his life, he was terrorized. He was threatened. His wife and family were until he's assassinated in front of them at the Audubon Ballroom. 
But the weekend, does, and I'll end with this, the Friday night before Sunday's meet, he said, if you want to come see the black nationalist, come down to the Audubon. He was clear about what he was, the black nationalist. You see what I'm saying? He didn't argue against, uh, uh, he, he, he argued for black folks' control of the politics, the economy, and the society. What was that going to look like? He didn't figure it out. He was killed before he could. You see what I'm saying? So I'm not mad at folks. Don't get me wrong. I talk loud because I'm the youngest of 13. If I didn't talk loud, I didn't eat. <laughs> but but they, they, they were trying to develop it in the context of a brutal struggle. So what's left to us 60 years later is to build on their thesis to apply them to ongoing struggles. Because every white person out there is not Bull Connor. And Malcolm says one of his biggest regrets was not telling that white woman where she could go, what she could do. But now you got white folks out here talking about Black Lives Matter. Did you imagine that? <laughs> we had one out here because we organized against the, the police murder of Osage Osaji, a brother who was killed here in State College. This is a white community. But you best believe we had 2,000 folks out there marching, most of them white, and you know where I was. You see what I'm saying? Led by a sister named Tierra Williams, a white woman named Melanie uh, Morrison, a Latina uh, a Martinez, and I'm blocking on, and non Ray Hostager, a Nigerian American. Right there, organizing right here. One of the white people had a, 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 a picket. Her sign said, white racism is so effed up, even white folks tired of this ish. You know what I'm saying? Yes! How do you organize to make the revolution you envision? Reparations, we have folks talking about reparations, but sometimes, and I'll, I'll end with this, folks get convinced. It's like a catechism of impossibility. As soon as you talk about black potential, they'll tell you about what we can't do, what's going wrong. So, no, I, I don't operate like that. You see what I'm saying? So what did Malcolm leave us to build on? I keep saying if, if Malcolm could have seen Watts, he wouldn't have been waiting on Nkrumah. Nkrumah was going to be out of office a year later. He wouldn't have been looking for Ben Bella. He was about to be overthrown. If he could have seen the black capacity right after the Voting Rights Act was spent, we still had Watts. I think Malcolm would have oriented himself more here because the black struggle was already international. Du Bois wrote Appeal to the World in 1947. We charged genocide in 51 the UN. Malcolm came to the UN. What was that going to do? Who controlled the UN at the time? The US did, <laughs> you see? What Malcolm is trying to do, though, is what we build on with different strategies and techniques, just like we did the Underground Railroad. And as people talk about Malcolm and keep saying things like, by any means that say, do your thing. One of my favorite quotes from Malcolm, how you confront this white supremacist, his words, verbatim, rock him to sleep. So yeah, have a holiday for him, good. Have Shoshana Shakur show up to speak though. You're gonna have a different kind of presentation than you thought. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we are, the last few minutes was for uh, Q and A. Uh, do we have any questions that have been posted in the chat? And uh, I, I think the chat from the audience. I don't think we can see it. So oh. somebody that's in the back, in the background, is uh, will post those questions in the chat. So uh, do you all? Any of you all have any closing, or would you all like to make some closing re remarks? Since it appears that we don't have any questions. Well, I I just want to say um, again, um, thank you for having me um, today, um, Dr. T. K. and I'm honored um, to always be on the same panel with all of you all, and, um, um, and and thanks for holding me up, lifting me up, and educating me, because, you know, even though I might be the oldest, <laughs> they're still educating me every day, um, and I'm so proud of all of you for everything that you've done um, on, in the movement, which I'm sure has been also inspired by our, our beloved uh, Prince Malcolm X. And I want to close with uh, one of his um, quotes. And uh, Malcolm said, um, you know, t um, let me see, I got the wrong one. Uh, speaking like this doesn't mean that we're anti-white, but it does mean we're anti-exploitation. We're anti-degradation. And we're anti-oppression. Mm. So that's my Malcolm quote for today. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, Baba Earl, if you have, well, 
Either one of you all could go first. Enough for me. Just, I, I, I just wanted I, I, I to remind you. What Sh Shekinah just said. I, I rest on that one. <laughs> well, I wanted to also ask you, Errol, to tell people where they can get your book. One thing that I, one of the things I admire you for, you made sure that that book is available uh, for free. So could you tell people where they could get that? Oh, it's, it's, it's on the, I hope you all put the link in. Uh, that's yeah, it. There. Just link under that. But also, if you just Google my name, and I'll send you a PDF of the book as well. But that book is free, and my, my last book is free uh, as well. Um, so, yeah, thanks for putting that link up from Project News. Thank you very much. What? Tell us the name of the last book. Oh, man, I have to actually remember what the title Here it is. Uh, <laughs> it's on religion and world politics. That's what pays the bills. I do a quantitative analysis of, of war and world politics. It's called Scripture, Shrine, Scapegoats, and World Politics. That's the last one published by University of Michigan Press with uh, my colleague from the Corlett to War Project, uh, Zev Miles. And, um, but it's, it's largely a quantitative analysis. It's a lot of statistics. Uh, the revolution will not be theorized. The only numbers are page numbers. But that's, that's part of what we are. The first quantitative analysis in, uh, in uh, conducting the United States, not by a black person, the first one, 1899, the Philadelphia Negro. That's W.B. Du Bois. So these are all parts of our tradition, just like scholar activism is parts of our tradition. Never accept that people say, which one are you going to do? Both. OK. And still is. OK. So um, uh, so the book and if you can't get it. Uh, but again, I'll send you a PDF of it as well. Just send me a, uh, an, an email. And Thank I you. Want to, I want to back up uh, Malik before, if you had something to say before you said Mama or no, go ahead. But I wanted you to announce Mama Shoshana. Aren't you all having a program tomorrow? Thank you. Yes. Um, it's actually four groups, um, four grassroots. It's um, Malcolm X Grassroots Movement Detroit. That's the organization I'm with. Um, it's the Black Legacy Coalition, which I'm also a part of that. And I believe uh, Kafense, you are, and uh, Malik, I believe you are, uh, Black Legacy Coalition. Um, and then it's um, EMIAC. Um, and um, is a dream. So those four organizations are sponsoring a Malcolm X Day celebration. It is uh, free, open to the public. It is at the Commons on um, Cass and what, what street is Forest. that? Cass and Forest. Cass and Forest. Thank you. From 6 o'clock p.m. to 9 o'clock p.m. And there will be speakers, um, uh, President. Uh, those of you who um, know um, Kwasi uh, Akuma from the Shed, he's one of the speakers. Um, let's see, is um, Mark uh, Crane from Dream will be speaking. Brittany Ward or uh, B. Ward, she's, um, she's a young activist poet. Um, she's on the program. And our um, Kari Frazier, who's also a, a young brother uh, a activist um, who has Detroit is different. Uh, he's speaking on the program. And so we'll see some young, younger people there. Right, right. And, 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 and there's an African market. Um, you know, please go and support the uh, vendors in the community, uh, food, um, everything. It's going to be a big celebration. And, and that's tomorrow celebrating uh, Malcolm's 98th birthday. Okay, Malik, did you have any? Yes, yeah, briefly, um, while Malcolm has had a tremendous influence on, on my life personally, and I hold him high, I think we need to be careful that we move beyond the kind of idealist, idealized notion we have of Malcolm that you know shows up on buttons that we might wear or t-shirts and things like that. Um, Malcolm died 58 years ago and the world has changed a lot in 58 years. And so I think the thing is to try to glean from Malcolm what the principles are that he was standing on and for us to figure out how we apply those principles in the current time so that we continue to to move our, our movement for self-determination forward. Thank you. And I think what has come out in this conversation and your comments, Shoshana's and Errol's, uh, particularly as he said, Malcolm's work was not complete. So he left us, it's like he left us work to do. Mm -hmm. 
And it's important that we do it. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I anticipated we would have more questions. I'd like to thank the Juneteenth Committee uh, at Wayne State and particularly for our the, the director of that committee, Dr. Marquita Chambly, who has it helped to initiate the celebration of Juneteenth here. This is the third year. This will be the third year. And there's a, ser a week-long series of events. And I wanted to thank her personally because she's a... Uh, She's about to, she's announced that she's going to retire. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to thank her for her service. She's been the director of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Did I get it, the, the letters right? DEI. Uh, so I wanted to thank her and uh, I thank the committee for allowing us to uh, have this and thank you all for coming. And I wanted to announce to people again, this has been the Looking Ahead, the last in a series of Looking Ahead to Juneteenth events. And we have forthcoming several events beginning on June the 12th. There will be an opening ceremony at 2 p.m. And I think that will be on Gullen Mall. Uh, the second event will be a keynote address on June the 13th from 3.30 p.m. by Dr. Williams in the Burneth Auditorium, Auditorium, a celebration of art June the 14th at 11 a.m. And I'll put, well, people can't see the chat, but you can either go to wayne.edu and search for the events there, or you can reach out to me through my email address, address chike, that's C-H-I-K-E, at wayne.edu. There's a link. I'm sorry, I didn't even see that. The link at the bottom of the screen that can take you to a calendar of the events. Also, there'll be the celebration of art, which begins on June the 14th at 11 a.m., a panel about education in Juneteenth on June the 15th at 5.30 p.m. And then there will be a closing ceremony June the 20th at 2, B, 2, 2 p.m., excuse me. And part of the ceremony in the center of Gullen Mall, which is like the center of campus, they have this humongous flag. They raise the Juneteenth flag to open and uh, close the ceremony. So hopefully you'll join us there. If you have more comments or questions or inquiries, you can reach out to the uh, the uh, web address listed below. Mm -hmm. and I'd like to thank you all. Say Asante Sana, thank you very much. I appreciate your time, your commitment, yeah. and your willingness to be a part of this. Uh, Asante Sana. All right. Free to land. We'd like to thank everyone, and we'll say good night. Have a good evening.